This is our league, and this is your league. From the 55-yard line on CFL America Radio and the Sports History Network. Welcome to a special Black History Month episode of NFL 360. I'm Steve Weich. If we're asked to name the first African American to play modern Major League Baseball, we don't hesitate to answer. But if we're asked to name the first African American to play and coach professional football, most of us don't know. And it's time we did. Because long before Jackie Robinson, there was Fritz Pollard. Join us now as Nate Burleson leads us on a journey to rediscover a forgotten man. For 11 years, I lived the dream by playing in the National Football League. Now I spend the better part of my days living a different dream. Over the course of 38 years, I've lived my best life. That's been my journey so far. Part of my journey moving forward is understanding my past. As the NFL celebrates its 100th anniversary and looking back at the start of the NFL, one face jumped out a black face, a face not too different from mine. This is my journey to shed a light on the life of Fritz Pollard, to come to grips on why this man was forgotten, and to show the world who this man really was. He was a revolutionary. He broke down tremendous barriers. Phenomenal running back, hard to corral. An extraordinary player. He was extremely quick. The Barry Sanders of his day. Walter Camp, the name associated with the first real All-America compilation, it said something to the effect that Fritz Pollard ran faster than anybody his eyes had ever seen. Touchdown, and the ball game is over. When Fritz had the ball in his hands, something exciting was about to happen. He could throw the ball almost as well as anybody in the very, very infancy of pro football. Not the biggest guy in the world, but tough. And he understood that toughness meant not only on the field, but in society generally. Well, when you consider what American history was at that point in time, it was almost unthinkable, unfathomable, that Mr. Fritz Pollard would be doing what he was doing. He probably would be not known by too many individuals in America today, but he was one of the greatest running backs that ever lived. My journey of discovery will take me across our great country. No better place to start than the nation's capital and one of its newest and most important museums. What's up, sir? Nate Burleson. Hi, Damian Thomas. Welcome to the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. That's what I'm talking about. Cool. Let's go learn about Fritz. Yeah. All right, so this is the 100th year celebration of the NFL. And right there, 1920 world champs, Akron, professionals. And that picture, it says so much. There's one guy that stands out, the one African-American man, that's Fritz Pollard. You being a historian of the game, of African-American history, what can you tell us about Fritz Pollard and his impact on the National Football League? 
I think Fritz Pollard doesn't get the credit that he deserves as one of the early pioneers, one of the people during the 19-teens and 1920s faced tremendous adversity to be on the field. He was like no other athlete that we had seen before. And his talents were so undeniable that they had to recognize them. And he was so exceptional that they couldn't deny him the opportunity to compete at the highest levels. Like many of the other African Americans of his time, he found a way to make a way out of no way, creating opportunities for himself and for others. And that spirit is what's important to remember. What I love about this museum and this specific exhibit is that as an African-American professional athlete, I can look at men who did it before me. So if you learn about our history, you don't have to be a slave to the system that is sports. You don't have to be just a guy on the field scoring touchdowns. You can be so much more than that. I want people who come to the sports gallery to realize that sports matter far beyond the playing field. Mm. That sports are an entry point to larger political, social, and cultural conversations. We want people that come to the museum to realize that African American history is not a subset of American history, but it is American history. Mm. We want people to see how central the black experience is to our national story. Coming up next, Fritz Pollard's Ivy League education. Learning that being given a chance didn't equal being given respect. President Fonce said, young Fred Pollard, he's as good as a white man. My father came from Oklahoma. There, going to school and working in a barber shop, he met my mother, who was born in Oklahoma. And they, they were married in Oklahoma. And they left Oklahoma and they moved up to a place called Rogers Park, which is in the, way on the north side of Chicago. In 1920, the NFL was founded and college football was king. So the new league sought out collegiate stars, including a slight but athletic young man from Chicago. Fritz Pollard's talents were taken from the Windy City to one of America's most prestigious institutions of higher learning, Brown University. Well, first of all, he got the Brown late because they were still wrestling with some eligibility issues and admissions issues. So as if it weren't bad enough that he were black, he had to join the team that already had been practicing. The teammates basically shunned him, moving in and out of the shower room and so forth. But on Wednesday, Robbie had a practice of what they call Bloody Wednesday scrimmages. Those were scrimmages in which the subs were trying to displace the varsity for starting positions. So Paul had got in the game, the quarterback gave him the ball, he went around the end, uh, made a, a zig in, cut outside, went for a score. The end was a guy named Butner, who was a Southern player, who started using the N-word on him, and he said, send that little so-and-so around here again. Same play, quarterback obliged, sent him around the end, did a different fake this time, same result. After the third time, Butner went to Coach Robinson and said, I think we'd better let him join the team. They had never seen a black player before, so the road certainly was not easy for him. I mean, it was very, very difficult, but he gradually won them over, and when he finally started to, to shine and make great plays and, and uh, be a, a game changer, he was accepted on the team. It was as simple as that. He certainly had to earn his way onto that team, uh, as no other player did. America is a young country. It's a great country, but it wasn't always a country for everybody. Racism was a disease that afflicted the whole country. And while no place was immune, there were certain colleges that did accept African Americans. I mean, if you were an African American at an Ivy League school, then that means you were a leg up on African Americans in the ACC, oh wait, because there were none. Or in the SEC, oh wait, because there were none. 
or in with the old Southwest Conference. Oh, wait, because there were none. So you basically had African-Americans going to school and being able to compete in, what, three conferences? I guess you clearly had, you had the Ivy League, you had the Big Ten, you had the Pac-8. The Ivy League probably had as many who had prominent roles as any of those leagues. As we sit here on the steps of Brown, there's one question that keeps popping in my head. How did a young black kid from Chicago in 1915 end up here at Brown University? Well, he bounced around. He had his, his older brother was at Dartmouth. He had played football for Dartmouth. And from what I understand, I've heard Leslie was a better ball player than my grandfather. What? Yes, that's what I heard. So, my, you know, I, I grew up hearing that. And he taught my <laughs> grandfather how to play. He, first, he went to Dartmouth because that's where Leslie was. Yeah. And he wanted to be with Leslie. And Leslie said, no, this isn't the school for you. He came down here finally, and he came to Brown. The football players gave him a hard time at first. They gave him the last uniform they had, right. which was all torn up and everything, had holes in it. That night, my grandfather stitched everything up, patched all the holes. And he was the only black guy on the team. Only black guy. Can you imagine being thrust in the area where basically you're the only one? Mm. It's shocking. His personality was so bubbling yeah. that basically he won people over. He dug in and wanted to open the doors for everybody to prove that everyone, no matter what color your skin is, you're an equal. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be given a chance. Fritz made the most of his chance at Brown, leading the school to his first and only Rose Bowl, becoming the first African-American to play in the granddaddy of them all. In the following season, he was even better. The 1916 team was Brown's best team to date in history. They had six shutouts in nine games. We had never beaten Harvard. They blew Harvard out of Harvard Stadium. 21-0, Fritz had an amazing game. They called him the human torpedo because he ran low to the ground. He had a dodge step that would put people on the ground grasping at air. 148 yards and two touchdowns in the Harvard win. Coupled with 144 yards and a touchdown in the win over Yale, two teams Brown had never beat in the same season. Led to Fritz becoming the first African-American back to be named to Walter Camp's All-American team and cemented his place as a Brown legend. Dr. Mackey. Hey. How you doing, Nate Burleson? Pleasure, pleasure. Peter Mackey, class of 59. Class of 59. I hear you're the one to come to if I want to learn more about Fritz Pollard. Uh, I know a little bit about Fritz Pollard. That's true. All right, yeah. well, let's do this. Okay, let's take a walk. So what can you tell me about the man known as the human torpedo? torpedo. Well, he was an outstanding, outstanding football player, but more importantly, in my view, he was an outstanding human being, and that counts for a lot. He devoted his life to helping minorities, and he was a very, very loyal Brown alum. Uh, he stayed close to Brown all his life, and... Uh, helped uh, kids come to Brown. What have you heard about his times here as an athlete and as a student on this campus back in 1915? Paul had changed the fortunes of that team. Never had beaten Harvard. But even, and this is an important footnote, even though he was the hero of the campus, President Fonts stood right down there and pointed over and said, young Fred, he called him Fred, young Fred Pollard, he's as good as a white man which was an unbelievably racially insensitive comment, but he didn't know At anybody. At the time, seemed like a compliment, anybody. right? No, right. He, because right. of the day right. and age it was right. in. Right. Now, everybody knew he was better than anybody on that team. In the Yale Bowl, he was serenaded by the Blackbird song. Correct. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, the Blackbird song was a derisive song. It haunted him all his life. Later, when he was in his late 80s, frail sitting there on a couch with with James Mishner being interviewed and Mishner leaned over and said they sang songs about you didn't they and Fritz said yeah bye bye blackbird and then he then he proceeded to go bye bye blackbird 
Bye bye blackbird. Da 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 bee da ba ba da ba ba da ba. Bye bye blackbird. And the tears started coming down his cheeks, and it was clear that as much as he tried to get past that and put it aside, the the hurt was still there years and years later, which is a lesson to everybody. And when I think about Paul and his legacy, I, my feeling is what he taught us was how to be the best person we can be, how to, how to deal with all kinds of, all kinds of crapola, which people threw at him, yep. and still be positive about life. He was a positive life force, mm. um, and he wanted us all to be the best person we could be. Even though I didn't know him, right. I've, I've really taken that to heart, and I think that he was a great role model because he really empowered people around him. After the break, NFL Genesis, the beginning of pro football and the first steps of Fritz Pollard's extraordinary journey from star player to head coach. In 1919 when he came, there wasn't even a league yet. So he stayed with Akron when they joined as charter members of the National Football League. And there was really two players at the time, both in Ohio, who were our marquee drawing names. One was Fritz Pollard and the other was Jim Thorpe. The National Football League began on September 17th, 1920 in Canton, Ohio. So there were 14 teams that actually began in the league. But an interesting thing after the meeting was over, the uh, newspaper coverage, which was it was modest, it was, it was a new venture, not a lot of hype around it, uh, but there was three reasons announced in the newspaper accounts of why these gentlemen founded the, the, what became the National Football League. And those three reasons cited were to combat players' high salary demands, to prevent players from jumping from team to team, and to protect college eligibility. 100 years later, how we doing? Same issues. In the mid-20s, after New York came in, after Tim Maurer bought the Giants franchise for us something like $500 or $2,500, they started a season with 22 teams and ended the season with 12 teams. And there were literally dozens of teams in the NFL in the 30s, in the 20s and 30s. So when you talk about the NFL and what kind of a league it was, that's the first thing you need to understand is that there were new people, new teams, new coaches, new players every year almost for the first 15 years or so. It really didn't stabilize until I think in the mid 30s, late 30s. Into the shaky new league came Fritz Pollard. And his magnetic talent brought instant credibility. After I finished at Brown and I went down to University of Pennsylvania and I studied dentistry, I went to Cleveland, Ohio to finish my senior year in dental college. And they came to me by playing pro football. And they made me a pretty good offer. So I finally went out with Akron and, and began playing pro football. Fritz Pollard began his pro career uh, with the Akron Pros, first in the pre-NFL year of 1919. Everybody knew, knew of his great ability, and he was a draw. He was a someone that pro football needed to help their gates. This was a very young, struggling league. But in 1919, when he came, there wasn't even a league yet. So uh, he played in Akron. He stayed with Akron when they joined as charter members of the National Football League. And there was really two players at the time, both in Ohio, who were our marquee drawing names. One was Fritz Pollard and the other was Jim Thorpe. Like Fritz Pollard, Jim Thorpe stood out in those early days. He was a Native American who faced his own racial discrimination even though he was considered the greatest athlete of his time. Thorpe and Fritz were marquee names, transcending the color of their skin. He was hired by Akron's owner, and he was signed. Back there in, in you know, 1919, $1,500 a game was an exorbitant amount of money for somebody to make. The only other person that was making that kind of money was Thorpe. So for my grandfather to be making the same amount of money as Thorpe, that really was putting on how much he was worth. And for Akron to go out the first year, and they were the first undefeated championship team in the NFL. They were 8-0-3. And of course, the team that they beat was Thorpe's team, the Canton Bulldogs. I always thought what is amazing about that first team 
is that that was a very, very thrown together early example of what professional football would be. So many of these teams were like town teams. If you had a good base of football in your area, you had a chance to be a good team. The Akron pros, they didn't care. They didn't have to be from Akron. And I think that that's one of the things that made this team so good early on. His role was probably the biggest offensive weapon on that team, which is why he was on that first all-pro team. Fritz is also kind of the litmus test for the other few 13 total uh, black players from 1920 to 33. Fritz was the guy that would help guide them as to what cities they could play in and help them along in terms of what the expectations might be. You can draw a direct line between the brotherhood Fritz nurtured back in 1920 and the one we have in the game today. What's up, big fella? What's up, what's up? How you doing, man? You know, another blessed day. I hear you, man. I can't, I can't complain about too much, you know? So we're here celebrating another great season for you, another great season for the NFL, and also celebrating year 100. But that got me thinking on the beginning of the NFL. And I'm learning about Fritz Pollard, so I got to ask, what do you know about Fritz Pollard? You know, Pops been in the league for 13 years. Uh, you just go through the living legends. What you say, Fritz Pollard, I'd say, you know, Jackie Robinson. Like, mm. you put him in just somebody who broke barriers, who did what they did on the football side. Now, beyond that, you're like, well, like, when did he play? Somewhere in the 1920s? <laughs> right, right, like, what, right. like, what exactly happened to him? Like, why don't we know more about Fritz? That's, yeah. that's about where my knowledge stops. Yeah, 1915, he was a young man that went to Brown and was one of the first to accomplish so many different things before he got into the league. Have you encountered racism early on in your life or even in the league? Way later on in my life. Like, you know, as a West Coast kid, you don't catch those vibes. Like, Wait, so you're biggest... later on, you mean like as an adult while you were in the league? Yeah. I'm talking about oh, absolutely. The field. No, no, absolutely. So, really? Right when I first got to uh, the South, you know, mm. um, the first off season I was out in uh, Alabama, get pulled over, you know, windows are tinted. And you'd be like, all right, so that's why I got pulled over, windows tinted. As soon as, you know, you roll down the window and he realizes, you know, it's not even whatever. Hopefully it's because I'm a 6'4", 285 right. pound man. I know man. what's happening next. It happened to me too. Get out the car. Huh? Right. So whose car is this? Mm. Mine. Right. Like, why, why would this question even be asked? Do you think now, in 2020, the NFL and the sport of football has united us a little bit more? As fans. I think you compartmentalize that. At one point, fans love you because of the sport you play, because of what you do. But that doesn't separate them. Like, after you take off your helmet, after they take off their fan jersey, they're who they are and they're, we're who we after are. After we take our jersey off, we still black. Right. When you look at yourself, because I know you, man, you're a ball player, a businessman, a family man, philanthropist, you do it all. Do you think an individual like Fritz Pollard gets the credit he deserves for, let's just call it what it is, being kicking, the first, kicking down the door for us? Um, absolutely not. I mean, you know, we, you talk about Jackie Robinson, but for, you know, every Jackie Robinson, who was the first NHL player, the right. first black NFL player. We're not highlighting everybody. We got to tell these stories. Right. Since Fritz Pollard stood for equality in a time where he wasn't equal, and so many years later, we're still trying to find that equality, what are you doing, not just in the game of football, but in the game of life, to help unite and keep Fritz's spirit alive? Probably every off day I have during the season, I'm out in the community mm. talking to kids about academics, talk to kids about playing sports, talk to kids about being active. I'm always in some sort of elementary, I'm always in some sort of middle school, um, pushing forward for a positive image. And it's not just about African Americans, not just about Latinos, it's not mm. just about Asians, it's about the culmination of what we have. And I figure it's sort of like the pay it forward program. The more positivity I put out into the world, the more they see somebody like me, somebody who, you know, is, is an African American, somebody who is yeah. a, a dad, somebody who is somebody's brother, somebody, so you look, I'm trying to make them look beyond color. Because at the end of the day, if we can all see each other just as another person yeah. and then another person of color, that's only going to help the next person over. Coming up next, it was the Roaring Twenties, but beneath the rise in economic fortunes was a rise in racial tensions, threatening to end Fritz Pollard's career as quickly as it had begun. He used to have to have security. 
at their games. And they made sure that he didn't come to the games too early because they were worried about an incident. America in the Roaring Twenties was a country on the rise. Jazz filled the streets. Cities were booming. And sports enjoyed a golden age. It was also a country engulfed by racism. This was the world first public lived in. And life in the NFL was a reflection of America at large. 1921, uh, there were 59 African Americans lynched in this country. Uh, so when you, when you put that in perspective, Jim Crow w was at its highest at that particular time. To imagine what he went through during that time, where he had to sleep, where he had to eat, uh, just in terms of traveling around with his football team and enduring all that is something special. Playing football, he endured abuse, physical, as well as emotional, verbal, from teammates, from opponents, on the field, off the field. On the field, he was abused when tackled heavily, so much so that he developed this method of flipping onto his back as soon as he was tackled and cycling his feet like he's riding a bicycle up into the air and then flipping up as he's doing it, such that anybody who's trying to attack him while he's down will catch a cleat, you know, to the chest or, or to the head. That was his means of protecting himself on the field. There were reports of him getting hit high and getting hit low and, and tr people trying to break him in half. He had to endure that. He didn't get along very well with Jim Thorpe. When they first met, at the first time they played, Thorpe walks up to him and says, N-word, do you know who I am? And my grandfather used the N-word right back at him, said, yes, I know who you are. Do you know who I am? And Thorpe was just totally put back by that. And he used the N-word again, said, I'm going to kill you. And my grandfather said, well, if you are, after the kickoff, I'll be standing down there in your end zone, so and I'll be waving at you. After the game, Thorpe came up to my grandfather and said, you've got an awful lot of nerve talking to me like that. These derogatory comments, the unfairness, all of these things he had to endure. The NFL would not be proud of the way that Fritz had to break down the taboos and perform. And so we try to put behind us those things that don't make the country look good. But I think by recognizing the things that happened to him and how he overcame them can be an inspiration, not only to the African Americans, but to people at large. Despite constant verbal and physical abuse, Fritz was feared as a competitor and respected as a leader. This was shown in a move that was revolutionary, not only in professional sports, but in America in general. In 1921, he becomes Akron's head coach. The way he became head coach really was because they knew that he understood the game. He played college, major college football. He got to Akron, management just felt that, you know, we have an asset here we need to use. He knows the Brown system was very effective. People understood it, players liked it. This was something that just made all the sense in the world, and he was a leader. That was the other thing that uh, I think uh, Fritz is maybe undersold on and what a leader he was. I think it's almost unheard of to have an African-American man be the uh, head coach of a NFL football team back in 1920. For African-Americans during that time to be in control or, or to be the leaders of anything, it was, it was just hard to do. And for him to be able to be the first African-American coach and be a player at the same time, it just shows you the type of temperament he had, the type of character that he had, the type of intelligence he had to be able to handle something like that. It always impressed me, and borderline stunned me, that in 1921, when Fritz Pollard was named the player coach of the Akron Pros, that he was still not totally accepted in Akron as a star of this team. It didn't matter that he had been one of the best players in the league in 1920. That didn't matter. And it was so difficult for him at times, even in this position of great authority and as a star of this championship team, that he used to have to have security at their games. And they made sure that he didn't come to the games too early because they were worried about an incident. But I simply can't imagine being in charge 
of a team of men at age 27. Never mind fearing that something might happen to you because you're black and the larger society, many of them, do not want you in that position of authority. Well, if you talk about respect having to be earned, I mean, every drop of it had to be earned if you were black and trying to lead white men at that point in our history as a country. You know, you think about how daunting that must have been. I mean, we were only a few decades after the Civil War when the country wasn't even sure it wanted to allow black soldiers to fight for a black soldier. So for a coach like Fritz Pollard, who did not have physical stature, we're talking about somebody who was like five foot seven, 150, 160 pounds tops, uh, to come in and command, that was just an extraordinary thing. When you think about the lack of sort of support resources that Fritz Pollard had in the 1920s, it's unthinkable. They did allow me to change the system and bring in a, a more a system that was better than what they'd been playing. And I wanted the honor of having being the first black coach more than anything else. A century later, Fritz's coaching legacy and work live on, thanks to an alliance that bears his name. In the fall of 2002, the late Johnny Cochran and I put out a report, black coaches in the NFL, superior performance, inferior opportunities. That triggered this whole movement mm. and brought all this national attention on this issue. And I had a deep study with statistics and showed that the black coaches were actually winning more often, the few that had the opportunities, right. went to the playoffs twice as op often, but then had fewer opportunities. We started to challenge the National Football League to do better when it came to hiring minority coaches, general managers, scouts, you know, throughout all the organizations. Now there's plenty of men and women that right. have been an intricate part for the advancement of colored people. Right. Why name the Alliance in Fritz's honor? I had happened to read a little bit about Fritz Pollard right. and realized there was a sensational African-American player in the 1920s and so I'm like, well, why not reclaim the history? We had a meeting at the Combine. I thought we'd get 10 people to show up, but they came by the dozens. Wow. And it was standing room only. We, didn't, we barely had enough room. And these were the minority coaches, yeah. the scouts. They all wanted to hear about this movement and be part of it. And John Wooten, the all-pro uh, lineman with the Cleveland yeah. Browns and best friend with Jim Brown, was kind of the spiritual leader. And what I pointed out is for this movement to last, yeah. it needs an affinity group of minority coaches, scouts, and so forth. And when I said that, the first reaction was, heads are gonna roll. Mm -hmm. Terry Robisky, to his credit, stood up and said, if heads are gonna roll, let my head roll. Mm. And then Ted Cottrell stood up, the defense coordinator. He said, if heads are gonna roll, let my, let my head roll. One by one, wow. everybody stood up and said, we've got to get behind this. And Coach Dungy said, Cyrus has a plan, let's get behind it. And once that happened, the concept was formed. Do you believe that we have made the proper steps in the NFL to give coaches of color the right opportunities? 100 years after this kind of vitriolic racism, the country has not fully recovered, and we still have a, a bias that's systemic in our society on racial grounds. Yep. And that's something I've been fighting my whole career, just to give people an equal chance, just to give people a level playing field. There was one organization that showed leadership when Johnny and I challenged them. It was the National Football League, because they took it as hey, you know what, we could turn this into an opportunity, we could do better. Yeah. And we've been at the table, the Fritz Pollard Alliance, ever since. Mm. So what have we achieved? First of all, we got them to agree to our proposal, which was to interview at least one minority candidate for every head coach vacancy. We got it extended to general managers. We got them to enforce it the, when the first time there was a violation about it. We haven't made strides. Have there been bumps in the road? Yes. So we have a lot of work to do. I mean, we could not have picked a better namesake.
We've worked with the Fritz Pollard Alliance now for years. They have been a great voice of wisdom, of checks and balances, because they're an independent organization. We work together. We find solutions and we find a better way to do things. And ultimately, our objective is the same and we have aligned interests, which is to bring the best possible people into the National Football League. The Fritz Pollard Alliance is moving the conversation into the 21st century. But progress isn't easy, and it rarely moves in a straight line. After Fritz made NFL history, the league took a huge step backwards, playing from 1934 to 1946 without any black players. When you get to the late 20s, you see a segregation attitude. There were riots in the, in the early 20s, race riots that probably exceeded or matched what happened in the mid-60s in America. So it was a societal change that led to a change in, in NFL. Plus, there were new owners with different attitudes. During that period, there was a so-called gentleman's agreement among NFL owners that they would not hire or employ black players during that period, and that's when the game suffered. Most of the owners were going to be in lockstep. They looked back and they said there was no ban on colored, Negro, black, African-American participation, but of course there was. And George Preston Marshall, the owner of the Redskins, uh, I mean, he held the line as long as any owner in professional sports. He held the line until the early 1960s, playing in a publicly funded new stadium in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, until uh, the attorney general, a young man named Robert Kennedy, said either you will integrate this team or you will be thrown out of the stadium. You won't be able to use this stadium funded publicly. And so George Preston Marshall, whose own fight song included the words, fight for old Dixie, changed to now fight for old DC. And it was changed sometime, probably not even until the late 60s or 70s. But fight for old DC was fight for old Dixie, fight for the South. Back in, in those years, let's face it, I mean, the, the country was still very deeply divided in terms of race. The mindset back then, it was a hell of a lot different than it is now, obviously. And there were people who just uh, made it happen, and it never should have happened, and that was the, the tenor of the times. The times were unkind to Fritz Pollard. After 1926, he would never play or coach in the NFL again. And the league would not see another African-American head coach until 1989. What's up? Great one. How you doing? I'm good. How you oh, doing? Oh, man. Reno's finest. Oh, look at you, man. <laughs> Appreciate the hospitality. Oh, well, come on in here, man. Art, it feels like a museum down here. It's a lot of history here. This is what a legacy looks like. <laughs> Early on in my career, we had a preseason game in, at the Hall of Fame. So we're going through the hall. There was this little machine on the side. I looked at it. And so I punched the button. There was this black guy. I've never seen a black football player from way back before. I had to find out who this was. I read it. Name was Fritz Pollard. And I kept punching that button. I must have did it 25 times to make it go back and forth over and over again. And then I would call my teammates. Guys, come over here. Take a look at this. This guy played back in 1920. Can you believe that? 1920, we never knew that. Why did you find it important to set the record straight when people kept asking you about being the first black head coach? Because he was the first. Mm. Well, I can imagine disrespect. Who are you? Mm. You gonna coach me? You gonna play with us? That's not gonna happen. And he probably responded, we shall see. Mm. And he went about doing his work, showing that he was capable of playing Showing, that, showing them that he was also capable of leading them as a coach. So he made his presence felt. What issues did you face as the second black head coach in the NFL? When I got the job, I felt that I would get some pushback from, from around the country. But this country, I felt, had evolved at that time where they could accept me. And I remember the first game we played against the New York Jets on Monday Night Football. History will be made tonight 
the first time that we have had the black head coach in the National Football League. There he is, Art Shell. Al Davis was a cunning man. He made the decision to hire me before a Monday night football game. Just think about that. He made that change because he knew nationally everyone would be watching. Art Shell has won in his Raider debut. He is no longer the first black coach in the NFL. He's just a winning coach right now. So we won the game. Mail started to come in. I only got five bad letters. And one of them said, and we made history that night also. Johnny Greer, official referee, first black referee. Wow. He was official that game. And after the game, I got a letter say, you and your nigger referee cheated and won the game. Mm. So every time I see Johnny, I say, Johnny, you know you're my nigger referee, don't you? <laughs> and we have a big laugh. But that was historic. And that was the only bad letter that I remember getting, only bad pushback that I got back. The country had evolved and they were ready for it. Art, you became the second black coach in NFL history back in 1989. It's 2020. What have you seen happen in the league since then? Not enough. When I started in 89, there was progress. Uh, after me, it was Denny Green, and, and Tony Dungy, and, you know, and Ray Rhodes. So we were making progress, which was great. Um, ownership was taking a look. And everybody looks at the owner, but they need to take a hard look at the general managers, because those are the guys that are uh, decide who goes in front of that ownership. And in my mind, a lot of the general managers haven't done a good job of that, of giving guys an opportunity to sit down and talk to the ownership. I get frustrated when I watch it with the... The league being majority yeah, African-American. Uh, there's something wrong with that. Something that has to be corrected. You sit down and write down the teams I have never hired a black coach, and there are some probably never will do it as long as that ownership is in place. And look at the ones that have done it. Right. You're taking a chance. Al Davis didn't give a damn whether I was black. You know what he said when he hired me? Hmm. He said, I'm not hiring you because you're black. I'm hiring you because you're a Raider, and I know you, and I know what you're capable of doing. That's why he hired me, not because I was black. I just happened to be black. Mm. And I love Al Davis to death. If you could say something to Fritz Pollard right now, what would you say to him? Fritz, the fight continues. We got to keep moving forward. You set the example. You made a difference. You made a difference for me. You made a difference for some others. Now we gotta make sure we continue to fight. Welcome back to NFL 360, I'm Steve Weich. Exactly 100 years before the Kansas City Chiefs won Super Bowl 54, the Akron Pros, led by star halfback Fritz Pollard, won the very first championship in pro football history. A year later, Pollard became the league's first black head coach. But as quickly as the doors had opened, they shut yet again on every person of color till after World War II. As our film continues, a question arises. Why are opportunities for minorities to lead still so difficult to find? Appreciate you joining me, thank you so much. This has been a journey for me to learn more about the beginning era of the NFL and more about Fritz Pollard. Walk us through the Rooney Rule and how it came to be. It came to be, uh, really, a conversation was started, uh, you know, early 2000s. And uh, it really was about the fact that there were very few uh, minorities being given opportunities to coach in the league. An attorney named Cyrus Mary and uh, Johnny Cochran started to talk to Commissioner Tagliabue and said, you know, what's going on here? This isn't right. 
Commissioner Tagliabue formed a, uh, an owner's committee and, and made my father the, uh, the chairman of the committee. And the result was the Rooney Rule, which uh, requires that each team that has a head coach opening uh, interview at least one minority candidate uh, for an open position. And, uh, you know, it's evolved somewhat from there, but that was, that was the beginning. It seems that the NFL was somewhat ahead of the game and um, when it comes to having a black head coach. And it seems like African Americans were there since the onset of the NFL. But then it all changed. That went away. Yep. You know, I, I know my grandfather had an African American player on our first team in 1933. And then, uh, you know, then I think in 1934, there weren't any African American players until the uh, late 40s. Now, speaking of your grandfather, did he ever express any regrets over not being able to do more to reintegrate the league sooner? He had an African-American player on his first team, and, and I think uh, if it was completely up to him, that wouldn't have changed. You right, know, he, right. he, uh, he was a big supporter of the, uh, you know, the Negro League teams that were playing around here in Pittsburgh in the mm -hmm. baseball. I think if it was up to him, uh, you know, it would have been different. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I think he had regrets about it. Didn't talk about it a lot, but I think he had regrets about it. And the evolution of the rule, where do you see it going? I think we're working hard uh, on a lot of different aspects of it. Uh, number one, to you know, make sure that opportunities are, are occurring at the lower levels of coaching so that, uh, so that people can rise up through the ranks and be prepared once an opening occurs. I think a lot of people are committed to it, and, and uh, so I think we're, we're making progress with more work to be done. Fritz never lived to see that progress. That doesn't mean he didn't continue to leave his mark. After the NFL passed him over, he founded his own pro team, the Brown Bombers, ran a talent agency, a film and music production company, and also published a newspaper. After the NFL, Fritz became a relatively successful businessman. Fritz Pollard was an individual who was able to evolve. When one uh, door was closed to him, he'd open another. And he did that throughout the rest of his professional career. In 1946, after a 12-year drought, African Americans returned to professional football. And in 1962, when George Preston Marshall traded for future Hall of Famer Bobby Mitchell, pro football was completely reintegrated. Within two decades of reintegration, many of the game's biggest stars were black. And that legacy continues on to this day. And it can all be traced back to one man, Fritz Pollard. My brothers never allowed me to even think the fact that just because I was black that somebody was going to come out and tear me to pieces. And I, I just eliminated that kind of thing from my mind. The players that played back in my day were rough. You couldn't tell what was going to happen in those early days. But I had a lot of fun playing pro football. Fritz Pollard's induction into the Hall of Fame is very significant because, as we all know, there were very few African-American athletes in the league until after World War II. So his performance showed society that merit was what mattered. The color of your skin did not matter. Courage is what mattered. Resilience is what mattered. Having a vision for what society could be as opposed to what society was is what mattered. How you doing? I'm doing well, Nate. How are you? <laughs> Good, to, Good see to see you. Great to see you. Appreciate you coming. Thank you. Now this is some unbelievable, uh, unbelievable memories. In it here. really is. During this process, I've learned that Fritz was so much more than just a football player or a coach. Did the way he approached life off the field have an impact on you? When I went into the Hall of Fame in 2016, people were saying, oh, how does it feel to be the first African-American coach? I said, no, no, number two. Right. Because Fritz Pollard set the standard years before. I can't say that I modeled myself after him because I didn't know that much about it until right. I did the research. I was proud to be associated with Fritz Pollard uh, and be the second because he did set the standard so high. I came into the league in 1977 as a player, or no, African-American head coaches, 10 assistant coaches in the entire NFL the entire at that league. time. So we had 28 teams, 
Ten teams had one African-American coach, 18 teams had zero. I went to Pittsburgh, no African-American coaches on the staff. It wasn't even something you thought about at right. the time. But then when I became the head coach of the Bucks, I said, can't be that way. I've got to make sure these guys get an opportunity. And I got a lot of criticism right. at the time. These guys hadn't coached in the NFL. How are they going to be? And, you know, 10 years later, they showed what they could do and they're in Super Bowls and leading right. teams. It was a good feeling. How do you feel about where the league is at right now? And the representation of color throughout the NFL. We seem to hit peaks and valleys, and getting that opportunity is really the most important thing. I played for Chuck Knoll, he believed in me. He called me, I was 25 years old, and he said, I want you to be on my staff. Wow. And he did that because he believed I was gonna be a good coach. And I felt like I had a responsibility to him to, to prove him right. Well, I knew when I became a head coach, there were a lot of Tony Dungy's out there that just needed that first opportunity. And so I felt like I could do that and give guys a chance to show what they could do. So hiring Lovey Smith and Mike Tomlin and Herm Edwards, it was the right thing to do. I knew I was going to get good coaches who were going to help us win. But I also felt like I needed to do something to help people understand that we need to get the league utilizing all our resources, yeah. not just part of it. If we're going to be the best league we can be, we got to use everyone. And I think that's what we've got to do. I was once told that when the lights go off and the doors are closed, that these busts talk to each other. <laughs> You're actually facing Fritz Pollard. When the lights are off and these guys get to whispering, what is Tony Dungy saying to Fritz Pollard? I think he's whispering, well done, well done, and thank you mm. for setting the bar. Thank you for being the leader, and uh, we're all following you. Fritz paved the way like so many other great historical figures. He did it against all odds. And the African-American player, coach, executive, can look back to what Fritz Pollard endured and say, surely, if Fritz Pollard could make his way in this game during those perilous times for black folks, then I can certainly do it. He was one of the greatest pioneers that ever lived and had the ability to move things forward. He's a hero, and he's not a hero just to black people. He's a hero to America and to Americans and to the world. What he stood for was excellence at its highest. He was the first black player at Brown University, an Ivy League school. He was the first black head coach. He was the first black player in the National Football League. He was the first black quarterback. In spite of the difficulties back during that period, he was able to achieve at a high level. He served his country. He was a successful businessman off the field, away from football. That reason demonstrates to me that if you put your mind to it, in spite of the obstacles that you may face, that you can achieve excellence. And that, to me, is the legacy of Fritz Pollard. Fritz Pollard may not be the household name he deserves to be, but his legacy is very much alive in the past, present, and future of the game. Everywhere you look, from the history of African Americans in football to where we still need to go, you'll see Fritz. And this journey has taught me that he's anything but forgotten. I'm at the bottom long gone. Welcome back to NFL 360. We first screened the Fritz Pollard story on the eve of Super Bowl 54, just up the road from Miami's Hard Rock Stadium on the campus of Florida Memorial University. The home of the Fighting Lions is an HBCU about to put a football team on the field for the first time in more than 60 years. But speaking with student athletes about hope and progress, the question has to be asked, in the 100 years since Fritz Pollard, how much progress have we made? Okay, so this was 100 years ago, right? We've made progress, but if you guys haven't noticed, things are here right now, okay? 
Here's a name most of you guys will probably recognize, Colin Kaepernick. Anybody recognize that name? Can someone tell me why? Right here? Because he took a need to stand for everything that was going on in the country. It's not really as much equality as we would like. It's not as bad as it used to be when our grandparents or our grandparents, grandparents, it's not as bad as it was. But at the end of the day, we still getting shot in the middle of the streets. We still getting pulled over for no reason. We're the leaders in most of the things that's going on in the world, but we're not getting looked at that way. We're still getting looked at like we're thieves and we in the streets all the time and everything, even though we're trying to do better for our life. Thank you. Did everybody hear what he said? Okay. So we're, 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 gonna, we're, gonna, we're, gonna start, we're gonna start this here because I was the person who broke the story. Colin Kaepernick, during a preseason game, sat down during the playing of the national anthem. My experience in life says something bigger is going on here than him tying a shoe during the playing of the national anthem. Have you seen anything in your life that impacts the way you go about your business and you handle things? Me as a soccer player, um, there's not many people, not many black faces in the soccer world. So a lot of the teams I played for mainly non-black teams. Um, so it would be a lot of racial slurs in games we play against opponents. Um, so that kind of made me think about how I need to um, compose myself, not get a hot head, not be who they think they want me to be. Casey? I didn't have really much that impacted me in that kind of way. Um, I mean, like I've watched the news and I've seen that and it hurts to see that because not all white people are like that. All right. And then it just puts a bad name on some people. Perception, right? How people think of you a certain way. Anybody? Gentleman right here. One big takeaway that I had from this entire film or the overall experience itself was appreciation. Now, the biggest thing with Fritz Pollard, let's put ourselves in his position understand some of the challenges that he faced, right? If we understand those things, then we will be able to appreciate where we are now in life because a lot of our student athletes don't have to deal with these things. We don't have to go and fight those battles. We're blessed, we're gifted, and we have an opportunity that we need to take advantage of. Well said. As student athletes, how can athletes force change? I think just going back and teaching what you've learned through your experiences to the ones that may not have to go through it if you teach it to them. Like me personally, I don't like talking about it, but you know, throughout high school I got in some trouble and ended up having to go to suspension centers and things like that. And now, you know, looking at hindsight, seeing what a waste of time that was and how that affected where I could have gone, you know, I don't complain about it anymore. But I, go, I try to go back, you know, very often and go talk to those kids that are there so they don't have to go through certain things that I went through. And then hopefully, you know, all it takes is to touch one person. You're not going to get everybody all the time, just like this entire crowd. You know, everybody's not going to feel what you're saying all the time, but as long as you have one person, you're making an impact. I want to give some special recognition because football coming back after being gone for more than six decades. Could the members of the Florida Memorial football team please stand up and get a round of applause because you guys are launching a new chapter in this program's history. Well done. All right, all right. Thank you guys so much. Remember what you saw in that film. Take it with you. Florida Memorial, appreciate you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. After the break, a labor of love, a labor of necessity. The making of Fritz Pollard, A Forgotten Man, is next. When I was making this film, one of the things that I kept coming back to is what would Fritz think about where we are today. Mm. Welcome back to a special Black History Month episode of NFL 360, and now I'm honored to introduce you to the team that made the film Fritz Pollard, A Forgotten Man, and that's executive producer Kyle Bowser and senior producer and director Anthony Smith. Well done, gentlemen. Thank you. And Kyle, I really want to start with you on this. 
This is a project you have been working on to get made, I should say, for, for quite some time. It's challenging at times to convince people the relevance of stories and that there's an audience that has a, um, a thirst for those kinds of stories. Um, what Fritz Pollard was able to do um, is an American story. And football is an American pastime, but it's always been reflective of the social consciousness of the nation. Whatever's happening on yep. the gridiron is happening outside the stadium yep. as well. And what Fritz had to deal with on the field, off the field, um, is, is a story that needed to be paid attention to. Anthony, I have to talk to you about Nate Burleson, who walked us yeah. through history. So what about the job Nate did in talking about his own self-discovery, as well as Fritz Pollard's discovery, in telling this tale? We initially thought that Nate, just because of the, the amount of work that Nate is doing, yeah. <laughs> that he wouldn't be able to do it. Um, he, Nate, Nate has more jobs than Ryan Seacrest, it seems. Um, but Nate told us that this is exactly the kind of thing that he wanted to do. And he told me something that, I, that, that, that has stayed with me throughout this, the fact that he wanted to tell this story for his children. And when this thing airs, he's going to sit down with his children and watch it because he feels that it wasn't only important for him to learn the story of Fritz, but it's important for them to learn the story and for them to know the story and for them to know where they came from. And, and I think the lesson to extrapolate from Nate's contribution is wherever, whatever station you occupy, you've got to be proactive about being a change agent. And I think if each of us takes that lesson away from that, we'll be able to excavate even more of these kinds of mm -hmm. stories. Because we all know about somebody who's made an incredible contribution, but the story has gone to ether. And we need to bring those stories back. That's my hope for this. Yeah, and Nate, Nate just, uh, yeah. just absolutely fantastic on this. Yeah. When I was making this film and when, you know, me and Nate would have conversations and discussions about what we were looking to accomplish with each of the shoots, one of the things, things that I kept coming back to is what would Fritz think about where we are today? Mm. Wow. Um, in terms of progress, you know, not just in the NFL, but the nation at large. And so I started thinking about my daughters. I have two young daughters. And I just started thinking about them and the, and the country that they, that they live in and the world that they live in. And my two daughters are two daughters that grew up in a country where there was a black president. Their first right. president was black. Right. It's like they grew up in a country where they can go to whatever school they want to go to, they can swim in whatever pool they want to swim in, they can play with whoever they want to play with. They can see a black uh, quarterback. They can see a black <laughs> quarterback. <laughs> and their father has the platform that he has to tell these kind of stories. So there has been progress that has been made. Uh, they also live in a world where I've been pulled over multiple times for driving while black. You know, they, they live in a world where we still have these challenges that we speak of in regards to diversity yep. within the league, but also in society at large. So I think that Fritz would be, be happy with the progress that's been made, but I also think that Fritz would look at the progress that, that's been made and say there's still a long way Absolutely. to go. You know, yep. there's, still, there's still more to be done. Well, I think you guys making a movie like this is very important. Nate Burleson killing it the way he did and telling this tale was important, and I can't thank you guys enough for, for making this film and educating all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. In the annals of history, much is made of those who were first. We're told about Neil Armstrong and the Wright brothers, and there's a reverence that accompanies their stories because they did what no one had ever done before. African-American first are often quite different. We learn of men and women who did what no one said they could do before or should do before or like Fritz Pollard, weren't allowed to do before. This is the truth of his story. Don't allow it to become a footnote. And never forget that when someone dares to be the first, they're inviting someone else to be the next. I'm Steve Weich. Thanks for watching NFL 360.